Okay, so hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, we're happy today to have our, well, our very own Charles Chang, well, instead of our very own Doctor of Boston in September, um, Charles is here at the moment. Um, as, yeah, he probably needs a little less introduction than most people, but just for people who don't know him, I'm going to give a little bit of um, background. So, um, Charles um, carried out his PhD research at UC Berkeley on first language phonetic drift um, during first, second language acquisition. Yeah, uh, and he published on many and varied topics, including phonetic and phonological aspects of Mandarin, Korean, Buenos Aires, Spanish. Um, but he's now continuing to concentrate his research on the area of um, phonology and in multilingualism, so with L2 learning and lang language contact phenomena as well. Um, and that's what he's going to talk to you about today. Okay, thanks. Yep, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about um, three main uh, strands of my research that have been addressing these questions related to um, how people who speak more than one language which is the majority of the world, um, organize um, the sounds of their uh, two systems. So I'll um, <clears throat> start with just a very quick introduction as to some of these um, issues in the field of second language acquisition um, and how they relate to um, the studies that I'll be talking about. And I'll walk through three different studies. Um, and they're slightly different in terms of um, what they're looking at and also the population. Um, so they're either looking at um, change in the native language um, as a consequence of L2 learning, uh, second language learning, or they're looking at um, the influence of the native language sound system on um, performance in the second language. So kind of both directions of cross-linguistic influence. Um, and then I'll uh, talk a little bit more about um, kind of why this is important for linguistic theory um, and also for practitioners of language teaching. Um, so let's just start with some of the basic questions in the area. Um, this is uh, actually a very recent article from the Washington Post that um, speaks to an issue that's becoming actually very um, important in the field of language education, which is um, the fact that there are many people who want to learn a foreign language who already sort of know the language um, because they learned it when they were young and then they attrited, they lost the language um, as a consequence of becoming dominant in the, a different language of the community. Um, and then they have arrived at the situation where their parents, who were um, late onset learners of the dominant language of the community, didn't really learn it, and they have lost their native language. So they are in this situation where they can't really communicate with these people that they've lived with like their entire life. So this is just um, an example of um, an ABC, an American-born Chinese uh, young man from the States who um, speaks, who learns Shanghainese as his native language and doesn't speak it anymore, and his parents, who are native Shanghainese speakers, don't really speak English. So there's this communication problem. Um, and he now is trying to learn Shanghainese uh, in school. Um, and he's a special kind of student because he has this early experience. And part of what I'm interested in is what the nature of that experience is, both for his Shanghainese and also for his English. So <clears throat> that, that's basically what the question is. How, how do new native speakers of one language learn to command um, the sound system of a second language, which I'll refer to as L2? And um, kind of in the reverse direction, um, how does someone who is a native learner, a native speaker of some uh, L1, first language, um, how does that native language system change over the lifespan um, as a consequence of things like um, learning a second language? And so what I'll try to show you in all of these studies is that um, these two uh, sets of phenomena, first language, perception and production, and also second language perception and production in people who are bilingual can't be examined independently, but in fact there's um, insights that are to be gained by considering them both um, at the same time. So you use this sort of integrated approach to these two areas. Um, okay, so um, just some quick background. Um, anyone who studies L2 learning um, needs to know about these two things, uh, which I'll refer to as universality versus transfer. So the first idea is that when uh, people are learning a second language, um, it doesn't really matter uh, what first language they speak. There are certain things that are common to people who are learning a target language, in particular 
when they're adults. When they're starting to learn the language late, there are certain preferences, there are certain structures, constraints, processes that influence the learning process, and this is independent of the target language that we're talking about and also the native language. So just one quick example is um, that consonants tend to be easier, well, depending upon what consonant, but consonants tend to be easier to learn at the beginnings of words or before vowels than they are at the ends of words. And that's a universal or something that's been proposed to be universal across languages. Um, so that's one uh, set of phenomena in L2 learning. And the second one <clears throat> is what's generally referred to as transfer. Um, and this is the idea that Actually, there are many very specific things that occur um, depending upon what the native language background is of the person who's learning this second language. So um, let's just take English for one example. Depending upon what your native language is, you're, for instance, going to have a very different accent. And a lot of those um, uh, uh, pronunciation phenomena can be traced back to features of the uh, native language background, the L1. So that's um, basically the idea of transfer, that your performance in the second language is highly influenced by features of your native language. Um, to get a little bit more specific, the field of L2 phonology in particular <coughs> has been influenced by um, I'll try to delineate three specific uh, principles that I'll be, I'll end up contradicting in the end. But um, the first one is that um, when you're learning a second language, there are often going to be some new sounds that don't occur in your native language. And um, when you're trying to predict how a second language learner is going to cope with this new sound, um, the way you make these predictions is to um, look at the two systems on a segment by segment basis. So the idea is that when a learner encounters some new second language, language sound, um, the way they get influenced or the way the L1 transfers into the L2 is um, by virtue of um, this analogy between allophones. So sound to sound or segment to segment. And so just to t walk through one example. Um, <clears throat> Native Mandarin's uh, speaking learners of English, they tend to have trouble with um, this voicing contrast in English, but much more con uh, trouble with the contrast in final position than in initial position. So in word pairs like bit versus bid, um, as opposed to tip versus dip. Um, and one way to account for that, according to this type of framework, is to say that um, the native Mandarin learner of English, they're mapping this English contrast in final voicing at the ends of words um, based upon what sound in Mandarin is most similar to that English sound in that environment. So this is a position specific uh, level of analysis of individual segments. So for tip versus dip, it's not so hard because actually those sounds are very similar to a contrast that Mandarin does have, which is one of aspiration. So um, English T at the beginning of a word um, gets mapped to the native Mandarin uh, aspirated T. And so that's actually pretty straightforward and, and the two sounds are very uh, perceptually similar. So that's uh, the nature of the explanation for why native Mandarin learners of English have this difference in performance between the two positions because it's position specific. <coughs> the second uh, principle that pervades this literature is the idea that L1 transfer is at best um, neutral uh, with respect to L2 learning. So um, for the most part, it's going to be harmful because there's certain differences between the first language and the second language that are not going to be beneficial. They're going to interfere with the per person's performance. So the second language learner, the adult learner is not a blank slate anymore and they have all these biases that they're bringing into the second language uh, process from the first language which are uh, sometimes irrelevant and also sometimes um, actually uh, uh, harmful because, for example, let's take a Japanese learner of English. <clears throat> they tend to have trouble with this LR contrast in English and that can be explained in terms of Japanese having similar sounds but they don't contract. They don't contrast in Japanese. Uh, and so the Japanese learner, when they learned Japanese, learned actually to abstract away from the variation between L and R and to treat them as the same sound. So now when they go to learn English and have to now treat these as separate sounds, it's difficult because they've been trained in the native language to treat these as basically one category. Um, another way to explain this specifically um, with, a respe with respect to uh, phonetic cue is that um, they've learned to uh, treat the cue to this LR contrast, the for, uh, third formant or the F3 differently. It's not really contrastive in Japanese whereas it is contrastive in English. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the idea of negative interference. And then the third idea is that um, to the extent that you get any sort of uh, uh, flowback from the 
second language into the first language. This is going to be more evident um, when there's more second language there. So when you are very proficient, you have lots of experience with the second language, that's when you see these marked, marked effects of uh, second language proficiency on first language pronunciation. That's when you kind of start sounding accented in your native language, or start forgetting it, for example. <clears throat> okay, so we have these three ideas, allophonic linkage, negative interference, and then this positive proficiency influence relationship. <clears throat> Um, and I'll end up arguing that all of those ideas are either false or incomplete and not, don't accurately represent what's going on um, with L2 learners. <clears throat> so the first um, study I'll um, uh, walk through is this chain, uh, study of change in Shanghainese speakers of Mandarin. So these are Shanghainese Mandarin bilinguals. Um, uh, one thing to note is that Shanghainese is a minority language in China. It's not the uh, socially dominant language um, and it's spoken all over the world, but principally in um, the area of Shanghai, which you see here at night, and you notice that it's um, by the water. It's a port city, which is actually very important because that allowed for the history of Shanghai to be shaped in a particular way, where there was a lot of immigration that happened really starting around um, the middle of the 1800s <clears throat> for about 100 years. Vast waves of people came into Shanghai from neighboring regions, in particular people who uh, spoke other Wu languages. So Shanghainese is a Wu language. Um, in particular, a lot of this immigration came from the region of Suzhou. Um, that is what happened for about 100 years. And then starting around 1980, the second important event in the history of Shanghai is that um, China implemented a national language policy where Mandarin became the standard language and was heavily promoted as the uh, prestige language, the language of civilized people, and the language that you, mu you had to speak in school. So up to this point, uh, it wasn't uncommon for uh, school subjects to be taught in Shanghainese, but after this point, even in Shanghai, and among native Shanghainese speakers, all subjects had to be taught in Mandarin, and in fact, students were punished for speaking Shanghainese um, in school, like outside of class. So you had to speak Mandarin in class, you had to speak Mandarin out of class, and that was a big change from um, basically 1980 onwards. Those two events actually line up neatly uh, with the particular linguistic variable I'll be talking about, which is this contrast between two mid-vowels, um, an e and an e. <clears throat> so canonically, Shanghainese had this contrast between these two vowels, and um, they are reported as distinct in um, three sets of the Shanghainese lexicon, which I'll refer to by what the vowel is in the cognate set in Mandarin. So there's a set of, Mandarin, of Shanghainese words that, uh, whose pronunciation in Mandarin has this vowel I, and then there's a set that has the rhyme an, and then there's a set that has the rhyme a. So, and they all in Shanghainese um, get pronounced with some sort of mid-vowel, so either an a or an e. Uh, starting around uh, 1850, they're still distinct. It's a, a, e. So there's still a contrast between, uh, for instance, le and le. They're different words, <clears throat> and they sound different. And uh, after that, you get some merger of uh, two of these sets, and this has been attributed to the fact that there was all this immigration from neighboring uh, Wu language speakers who did not have this mid-vowel contrast. So this is actually one source, one uh, level layer of uh, contact influence. So this contrast is slowly getting lost because all these second language speakers of Shanghainese don't have this contrast in their native dialect. And then the contrast is being reported as merged right around like 1980. So there's no contrast now between this lexical set and this lexical set. They're all pronounced with e. Eh. And that's been what's been reported in the literature. Interestingly, <clears throat> now this contrast seems to have been revived because this uh, set, of the uh, Mandarin A set, has now readopted re this A e pronunciation. So whereas in this stage of the language, there was merger and no contrast reported. At this point, the contrast has reemerged. So basically, this has been a reversal of a merger. Um, the contrast disappeared, and now it's reappeared. Um, so this is the variable that I'll be discussing. Um, the degree to which people show this recovered contrast, this recovered distinctiveness. <coughs> because the hypothesis, given how similar that lexical set is uh, with uh, the Mandarin vowel, that Mandarin has an A 
vowel. Um, that the, the recovered contrast is coming from language contact with Mandarin. It's not just some um, uh, reversal of an incomplete merger where there were residual A pronunciations kind of floating around and those got um, augmented. Um, but actually what's responsible for this merger is um, the contact with Mandarin, helped along by the fact that there was this national language policy. Um, so that hypothesis led to three predictions in particular that uh, young people who are more subject to this policy because they went through either all or most of their schooling with this Mandarin only policy, they're going to show that recovered contrast more because they are more influenced by Mandarin. <clears throat> The second prediction is that um, both uh, young people and older people, they will show the contrast more, or the merger reversal more, um, when they are operating bilingually. So if they have to use both languages, like for example in a translation task, then they'll show the recovered contrast more. And the third prediction is that um, the reversal, the appearance of the A pronunciation, is going to be specific to this lexical set. It's not just going to show up randomly in the lexicon, but actually it's this set of words whose rhyme in the Mandarin cognates is A. They're going to show up with the A vowel, and in particular it's not just going to be A, it's going to be diphthongized. It's going to actually be an A vowel. So that's the, those are the three predictions from the first hypothesis. The second hypothesis is that um, this is not just about segment to segment, so the, the analogy here, um, at least from the first hypothesis, is that E is being anal analogized to Mandarin A, and that's how it's being uh, changed into A. But the second hypothesis that uh, we had in the study, oh, I should also mention that this is all joint work I've done with my colleague uh, Yao Yao from Hong Kong Polytechnic, um, who is a native Shanghai speaker. We got interested in this actually because uh, it was pointed out to her that she was pronouncing Shanghai wrong <coughs> by an older Shanghai speaker. Um, and one aspect of the pronunciation that was pointed out to her as incorrect was the fact that she was diphthongizing this vowel. And so we got very interested in, I mean, she's grown up her whole life speaking Shanghai, so how, you know, how is she speaking the language wrong? Um, and yeah, so that's why we got very interested in this. But <clears throat> the second hypothesis that we had with respect to this change was that um, the degree to which you're getting some sort of influence from Mandarin phonology is not strictly because this vowel is uh, similar, that you have this natural perceptual similarity we can think about in terms of acoustics or phonological features, but there's very, there are a lot of things shared between e and a, they're quite similar vowels, um, that the degree to which you get this influence from a is not going to just be dependent on the occurrence of a, but also other things in the context. So the whole word, the similarity at the level of the whole word will condition the degree to which you get A influencing E. Um, so this is now already departing from the, the basic thrust of the second language literature, which is basically all about segment to segment relationships. Okay, <clears throat> so we have these two hypotheses. And um, just to recap, we're looking at these three lexical sets. So there's three sectors of the lexicon in Shanghainese, the re relevant ones that have this vowel, that um, differ depending upon what the rhyme is in Mandarin. In Shanghainese, they're pronounced identically, or at least are reported to be, at some stages of the language, uh, pronounced identically. So this is le, le, le. They're all le. And they differ in terms of what the pronunciation is in Mandarin. So the Mandarin I words have I, and the Mandarin an words have an, and then the Mandarin a words have a. And the uh, idea here is that um, it's not so, it's such a problem to represent the Mandarin uh, and Shanghainese phonological <laughs> forms of these words differently when they're not very similar to each other. But when they are similar to each other, then um, there's this uh, tendency to equate the two, to link them perceptually across the languages. And this linkage, which um, I've shown here, is, is what allows for there to be this cross-linguistic influence. And in particular, that's going to happen at a lexical level, not necessarily at a segment-to-segment -segment level. So this is the set that we'll be watching out for in particular. <coughs> OK, um, so what Yao did was go to Shanghai and recruit a bunch of Shanghainese speakers. And we did this in a very controlled way because 
Um, Shanghai, is, uh, Shanghai is a very big city, and so we recruited the participants in the form of parent-child pairs. And we did this to control for the fact that people move all around Shanghai, it's a big city, so we wanted to control for immigration history and where they lived in, in the city. Um, so this is 24 people, and it's 12 parents and their children. And that's what the contrast is, uh, that's the two groups that are being compared. Um, they were asked to produce um, the critical items that contain this vowel, the Shanghainese e vowel, um, in these three lexical sets. And for the first study, there's three experiments, but for the first study, the reference level in all the models, the baseline that we'll be comparing everything to, is the pronunciation of this um, Mandarin I set, which is uh, a set that we don't expect there to be any diphthongization uh, in. <clears throat> um, we also were interested in maybe there would be some uh, effective frequency of the lexical items. So we entered that as a factor uh, in the design. And then also whether there would be any effect of the onset consonant. So these are other factors. Um, the most important thing here in terms of the design is that um, the speakers are uh, producing these items in two different types of tasks. And, and these tasks are designed to mimic distinct language modes. Um, we had uh, the participants read the items in the context of a meaningful sentence um, where uh, there's no Mandarin involved other than the fact that they're reading Chinese characters. So basically, we have them read a, a sentence and just ask them to read it in Shanghainese. All the interaction with them is in Shanghainese. There's no Mandarin produced in this experiment. Um, so that's the first task, which is um, as monolingual as we can get in Shanghainese, which, which otherwise is problematic to elicit um, without use of some sort of uh, writing form. And the second task, which is meant to be bilingual, to elicit a bilingual mode, is this translation task. And what uh, they're doing is basically they're hearing a Mandarin word being uttered over uh, speakers, and they're asked to immediately translate it orally into Shanghainese. So this is um, inherently a bilingual task. They have to have both languages activated because they're hearing Mandarin and immediately speaking in Shanghainese. Okay. And then um, we're looking at the acoustic correlates of vowel height and backness, F1 and F2 at the onset and the offset of the vowel to see what the quality is at both of these points, and in particular, whether there is movement of the vowel quality, movement of the formants, because that would indicate diphthongization. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about the statistical analysis, but um, it's in a mixed effects regression model, and we're entering all of these factors that I've talked about to see whether there's going to be any um, effect of these uh, different predictors, and then um, also entering in random terms for the fact that um, individuals are going to vary and also what family they ended up in is also going to have to some degree an effect on the way they perform. <clears throat> okay, so in experiment one, what you see here um, is a, a graph of how many of the tokens they produce get diphthongized towards the E direction. So if they move up and front, then we counted them as diphthong guys towards E. And what you see here is that the Mandarin I baseline is in the middle here because that's what we're comparing both Mandarin An and Mandarin A to. Um, there's no significant difference between the An and I words. Those both are really not very often diphthong guys, whereas the Mandarin A words are frequently diphthong guys by both the older and the younger groups, although the younger groups show more of a, an effect. In the translation experiment, it, the pattern is similar, except everything is augmented in the Mandarin A set. So there's more diphthongization for both groups, but still the younger, group, the younger speakers are doing it more. <clears throat> if we look at um, the quality uh, in terms of F2 and F1, um, so these are vectors that are showing you the change in uh, the formants um, at the onset and offset. So if you see a long line going in this direction, that's showing you that it's being heavily diphthongized towards E. It's going from A all the way to E. Um, and in the reading experiment on the left, you see that the Mandarin A uh, sets, which are these squares, which you can't really see, so I'm just going to point them out, <coughs> are getting much more diphthongized. That's both for the male and the female speakers, and both for the older speakers in the gray and the younger speakers in the black. But the younger speakers in the black are diphthongizing more. Those lines are a lot longer. 
And if you compare the reading experiment to the translation experiment, it's quite pronounced that the, both groups are diphthongizing more when they have to operate bilingually. And again, the younger speakers are doing it much more than the older speakers. So I have a few sound clips here of people um, <coughs> uttering this item, which means to match. Um, and this is uh, family 11, <laughs> the mom and her daughter, um, in the reading experiment. So that's the parent. And that's the daughter. And I think you can hear already that the daughter diplongizes a little bit more than the mom. And then in the translation experiment, you can really hear, especially the daughter diphthongizing. Where the, where the daughter is really diphthongizing, it's, it's just an A vowel. It's almost like the Mandarin vowel. Um, OK, so basically, we've confirmed this uh, suggestion in the literature that, yes, there's this A vowel emerging. And, and that is essentially um, reviving this contrast that didn't used to be there, um, at least at a certain stage of the language. Um, so yes, these Mandarin A words do seem to be more likely to be diphthongized. And they're diphthongized to a greater degree than these other two lexical sets, whose Mandarin rhymes are not so similar. And we're seeing this trend more in younger speakers compared to the older ones, and also in the bilingual task compared to the monolingual task. Um, now we wanted to see whether this would be modulated in some way by features of the lexical context, um, because um, that is the, the main hypothesis, that um, this is not just a, a, a feature or a, a side effect of it being close to A, but also other um, aspects of the context being similar or dissimilar. So the, the question is basically, if you have um, aspects of the lexical context that are different between the Shanghainese item and its Mandarin cognate, does that lessen the degree to which you get cross-linguistic influence from Mandarin? According to an allophonic linkage account, it shouldn't affect it, because the only thing that's relevant is A to E relationship. But in, in the view that I'm pro uh, promoting, basically, um, this should matter because uh, uh, relationships between words are also something that should influence the degree to which you get influence from a second language. Um, so in experiment two, we're looking at um, a subset of Mandarin A words that I'm going to refer to as structure mismatched because um, the Mandarin cognate has this additional medial, what in traditional Mandarin phonology is analyzed as a medial. Um, you could say that, like uh, in a tue word, for example, that wei is just a vowel. It's a complex vowel. But the traditional analysis of Chinese phonology usually has this somewhere else in the syllable structure. This is somewhere else. And where we put it is not super important. And I'm not going to commit to a particular analysis. All, is that, all that is important is that it is different. This set of Mandarin A words is syllabically different in structure from the Shanghainese uh, in comparison to the, the maximally matched uh, Mandarin A words that we saw in experiment one. So these words are being compared to the regular matched Mandarin A words and also to the baseline Mandarin I. In experiment three, we're doing something similar, but now we're looking at um, effects of dissimilarity in onset. So if the Shanghainese uh, word begins with a voiced onset, but the Mandarin word begins with an onset of different voicing, um, will that affect the degree to which you get this Mandarin influence? So um, the same two uh, sets are being compared to in experiment three. Um, one thing I want to mention before uh, I go through these graphs is that um, <clears throat> we don't know, and there was no prediction in advance, um, of whether the Mandarin A mismatched set would show a significant amount of difference from the Mandarin regular Mandarin A set, the match set. Because um, in fact, one way to think about this is that um, the Mandarin A set is leading this sound change. And they're doing it because they're so, so similar to the Mandarin, uh, the, the Mandarin cognates. The vowels and the onsets, everything is, is identical, essentially. Um, the structure mismatch and also the onset mismatch Mandarin A words, they are very similar too, but they're a little bit different. And the prediction is that they're also going to undergo the change by virtue of the fact that have the e vowel, which is still similar. And the prediction is that they're just going to be behind, that they're going to lag in the sound change. The, the fact of the matter is that there's really no way to predict how far behind they will be. So the important thing here is to um, look for patterns in the data that are either consistent 
or inconsistent with a scenario in which they are lagging. So there might be some cases in which they're not any different from the matched Mandarin A set, but what would be important would be if they actually show a difference from the uh, Mandarin uh, A set, the match set, that is only in the more strongly cross-linguistic task, the translation task, as opposed to the reading task. So that's the relevant uh, contrast to keep in mind. Okay. Um, but the fact of the matter is that when we look at experiment two, we do see that the mismatched Mandarin A set is squarely intermediate between the matched Mandarin A set, the regular Mandarin A words, and the Mandarin I words. So that's consistent with the prediction. When we crank up the level of potential cross-linguistic influence and make them do translation, now the difference between the mismatched Mandarin A set and the matched one goes away. And now they are not significantly different, although it tends to be a little bit uh, less diphthongized. Um, and that's also the case in translation, where in the reading experiment, these formant trajectories for the mismatched Mandarin A set are not as big. I mean, they're also diphthongized, but they're not as diphthongized as the matched Mandarin A set. Um, that difference goes away in the translation experiment, where they're both very diphthongized. <coughs> Um, the reading experiment is similar, except some of these differences go away. So uh, the Mandarin onset mismatched Mandarin A set is intermediate, but the difference here is not significant. Um, and that difference goes away, basically, in the translation experiment. Um, and you can see that in the format plots, too. Um, so basically, we found um, things that are consistent with the predictions. We found that the structure mismatched words, they are showing less of the sound change than the regular Mandarin A words, and that that only happens in the task that, uh, do that doesn't overtly encourage cross-linguistic influence, so the reading task. Um, so that, that happens both with respect to the offset format values and also the rates of diphthongization. Um, it, the pattern is similar in experiment three, although some of these differences go away. So what these results taken together seem to be suggesting is that um, the way people are relating these languages cross-linguistically is not being influenced only by these segment-to-segment -segment relationships, but also these relationships between lexical items. That there's a lexical linkage, not just uh, segment to segment. Um, so that's the main conclusion to draw from these results. Okay, so these are fluent bilinguals. They speak Shanghainese on a daily basis. They speak Mandarin on a daily basis. <clears throat> and the idea was uh, whether you'd also get similar multifaceted levels of cross-linguistic influence in people who are just starting out. So maybe the phenomenon is actually different if you were to look at ab initio learners, people who are just starting out, the novices. Um, and this set of uh, experiments I'm going to talk about was sort of relate, uh, motivated by statements in the literature on L2 speech that go something like this, where an L2 that is hardly mastered should not have much influence on L1, while an L2 which is mastered to a high degree should exert more influence. So this is expressing the idea that there's this direct correlation between how good you are in the L2 and how L2 influenced you are going to be in your L1. Um, so that raises the question of, well, you know, so is it the case actually that people who are just starting out are immune to this cross-linguistic influence, because that's essentially what this is saying. Um, and also, is it the case that you get this direct relationship between proficiency in L2 and influence from L2? And again, the same question that we had in the Shanghainese study, um, is this uh, cross-linguistic relationship that's leading to the influence um, occurring on an allophone to allophone basis? Um, so those are the same questions um, that we saw in the Shanghainese study. But here we're looking at People who are just starting to learn, and these are speakers of American English. Um, they're young college graduates, and they've gone to Korea to teach English. Um, part of their training is to learn Korean, because they're going to be in, for some of them, they're going to be in very rural areas of the country. Um, and so they're undergoing this very intensive six-week course of Korean instruction. It's starting from uh, scratch. <coughs> and during this um, uh, language program, I was there at the site and I was interested in, well actually I originally gathered these data as a control measure but then started seeing all these changes in their English and then that became my dissertation. <laughs> so um, uh, what, what happened here was they were reading um, the same English items every week, um, so the same set of items and the same procedure, um, and I'm analyzing uh, three uh, main sets of measures, the voice onset time in their uh, stops, this is correlated with the voicing contrast. And then the fundamental frequency, or F0 onset, in the following vowel. 
which I expect to be um, influenced uh, on the basis of some properties in Korean that I'll be talking about in a second. And then um, the acoustic correlates of vowel height and backness, F1 and F2. And the statistical analysis is similar, although I'm using a slightly different version. Um, okay, so why would we think that the pronunciation of English stops would change as a result of learning Korean? Well, one reason is that the Korean stops are quite different in terms of their phonetic properties. So um, this is a table of um, VOT values of the English stops in comparison to the most similar Korean stops. And what you see here, and the important thing to take away, is that for the voiced stops, of, the quote unquote voiced stops of English, BDG, those ones spelled that way, um, in comparison to the short lag VOT stops of Korean, the Fortis stops, there's basically no difference. They're very, very similar, which predicts then that there isn't going to be a lot of effect on the English stops, because learning this very similar stop series is not going to change their uh, pronunciation of the voice stops. The aspirated stops, on the other hand, um, they are all significantly more aspirated than the uh, English voiceless stops, which are also aspirated in at least word initial position before stress. So what you see here is that um, consistently the Korean series of stops is more has longer VOT, but the difference differs depending upon the gender and also the place of articulation. And one thing I want to point out in particular is that for female talkers, coronal stops are not very different between English and Korean. And in particular, that difference is the only difference comparing voiceless to aspirated that falls below the just noticeable difference, or JND, for VOT. So humans have a limit on the, the degree of uh, psychoacoustic difference that they can discriminate. And for VOT, it's been shown that generally this falls somewhere around 23 milliseconds in the uh, range that we're talking about. And this difference is smaller than that. All the other differences are longer, and so that's something to keep in mind, because then these different places might pattern differently. So that's the picture for VOT. Uh, so the prediction, basically, is that if you're going to be Korean-influenced in your English voiceless stops, you should start aspirating more and more and more. Um, for F0, the reason why this is relevant is that these stop series, the, both the Fortis stops and the aspirated stops of Korean, are laryngeally marked. And they've been described ad nauseum in the uh, Korean literature, but the important thing is that they're both associated with this pitch accent on the following vowel. They raise the voice pitch of the following vowel. And given that these are the stop types that are most similar, at least in terms of VOT, to the English stop types, what that predicts is that if you're going to be influenced in your voice pitch by learning Korean, everything's going to go up. Your voice pitch is going to go up, at least following the stops. So is that what happens? <clears throat> What you see here is both of these uh, variables, VOT on the X and F0 standardized against each person's range um, on the Y. And the women are in black and the men, are there, which are fewer, are in gray. And the numbers are showing you their value for that week in the language program. So basically you just follow one, two, three, four, five. So let's start with the females. So the females are not really changing much in VOT. Keep in mind, this is two milliseconds, so that's nothing. <laughs> so they're not really changing in VOT, but they're steadily going up in F0. So it is the case that over time, their pitch is going up. For males, they're also kind of not changing uh, um, uh, consistently in VOT, but their F0 is not changing in the same way. Um, we can talk later, maybe in the questions, about why this might be, but it's important to point out that all the teachers in this uh, language program are female. There are no male teachers. So the males do not have a male model for L2. OK. Um, so yes? What's the JMD for F0? So for this range, it's generally around 4 hertz or so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the effect of time is significant for VOT, but uh, uh, sorry, not significant for VOT, but is significant for F0, and that's being driven by the women. There's this gender by time interaction. It's only for the women that the effect of time uh, on F0 is significant. OK, so those are the voice stops. <clears throat> the voice stops are a little bit different because the women are increasing both in VOT and F0. So they're aspirating more and they're also raising their voice pitch. Whereas men are aspirating more, one, two, three, four, five, 
but again, they're not showing this consistent effect on their voice pitch. So time is significantly affecting VOT um, and F0, and there's also this gender by time interaction. Okay, so this is completely consistent with the predictions. <clears throat> What's interesting is that if you break the data apart by place of the stop, so these are the voiceless stops, to see how much more aspirated people are getting, that there's a difference uh, between the places where, if you recall, the, uh, the alveolar stops, the coronal ones, they were so similar in VOT, at least for the females, that um, the difference between them was not going to be noticeable, most likely. They are the place of articulation that also shows the smallest increase in VOT. So there's two things that are significant here. The first one is that they increase in VOT at all. Because if they're related segment to segment, that should not happen. So the fact that they're going up in VOT as well suggests that there's something else going on. That these learners are equating not T to T, but voiceless stops with aspirated stops and are equating these norms and that's how you're getting this influence of uh, on alveolars which shouldn't otherwise happen. However, that influence is being modulated by this segment to segment linkage as well. So I don't want to say that that doesn't exist because it does seem like that's having some sort of influence and um, tamping down the effect of the, like, the natural class level, voiceless stops to aspirated stops. If you look at the increase in F0 um, and compare the increase for the vowels following voice stops and for the vowels following voiceless stops with the items, the control items in the set that don't start with a stop, so these are words like all that just start with a vowel, um, what you see is this. So this is time uh, versus F0. So you see an increase in F0 of the vowel initials too. And again, this is not expected if the vowels are getting equated to other vowels, because there's no F0 in elevation, uh, F0 in ele uh, elevation in Korean just because you start a word. It has to do with an initial stop. So again, this is unexpected on a segment-to-segment -segment basis, but makes sense if we're thinking about F0 being linked globally across language, that there's some sort of shared control mechanism for uh, modulation of voice pitch that is being influenced globally by the fact that you have to raise your voice pitch a lot in Korean. Uh, for the articulation of these stops. But you notice, just like we saw with the alveolar stops, that they're like intermediate. They're not showing the same increase as the other places, as the other uh, onsets. And that is, seems to be indicating that there is still this influence of the, the stop to stop relationship. That the ones that are stop initial, these items, are going up in F0 more than the ones that don't have the benefit of starting with that stop. So that there's these two levels of influence that are going on um, is what you should take away from this. <clears throat> okay, so that stops. So English speaker stops are changing rapidly. Um, what was what would happen with vowels? Uh, so I looked at um, all over the literature to find some uh, phonetic norms for English vowels uh, of the states, and the important thing to take away from this uh, figure, which is very full of things, <laughs> is that. First, there's enormous dialectal variability even within the United States in terms of the organization of the vowel space. Those are all the colored uh, trapezoidal-like things or parallelogram-like shapes. And then the Korean heart-shaped vowel space in black, um, first of all, contains fewer vowels and the inventory differs in two systematic ways. There's fewer low vowels, there's fewer high F1 vowels because it's just ah, they don't have an a and an a, for example. And there's also fewer front vowels. There are fewer high F2 vowels. Because English has e, 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 a, whereas Korean has e and e. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Because when we look over the systems at the way these um, uh, vowel systems differ uh, phonetically, that leads to this difference, where it doesn't really matter what American dialect we're talking about. The Korean vowel system, if we take F1 and F2 and average over all the vowels in the system, is systematically lower in F1 and also systematically lower in F2 by virtue of the fact that there are fewer low vowels and also fewer front vowels. And I should also point out that these differences between the systems um, are greater than the just noticeable difference for frequencies in the range of vowel formants. So, I mean, this is much bigger than like four hertz. 
So uh, what happens to the vowels? Well, on a segment-to-segment -segment hypothesis, we should get the vowels actually going all over the place because their position in this F1, F2 space is different with respect to some sort of nearby vowel neighbor. And you don't get that. You don't get this disparate motion of all the vowels changing position, some going down, some going up, some going left, some going right. They all go up. And these are the females because they're the uh, more numerous ones, but actually the few males that I have do do the opposite. And we can talk later about why that might be. But um, this pattern seems to be some sort of global thing that's happening. All the vowels are going up. Um, and this is the case regardless of whether the nearest vowel that they're closest to would have them go down versus up. So like for instance, U here is going up, even though that takes it farther, farther away from the nearest Korean vowel, which is U. And this, uh, this is the um, horseshoe vowel, the put vowel. This vowel is also going up, but that actually brings it closer to the nearest Korean vowel, which is uh. So it's not really possible to construct a coherent analysis of this where people, where um, the learners are constructing these segment to segment relationships and consistently wanting to assimilate to the second language system. Basically, you get this generalized raising um, across the system. Okay, so just to sum up really quick. Um, for the stops, we saw a change in F0 and also in VOT. Um, in these novice learners, this happens very quickly, happens after essentially a week of instruction. Um, so it's happening quickly, it's happening in assimilation um, to the second language, and it's happening in this way that is, seems to both be specific to segments and also generalizing above the level of the segment. Um, whereas vowels are doing something different, they seem to be uh, do, uh, changing in a way that is systemic. There are changes happening to the vowels that, is not, that are not occurring on a vowel-to-vowel -vowel basis, but happening over the entire system. Um, so the conclusion basically to draw from these set, uh, this set of results is that novice learners do show the same type of influence on the second language as these advanced learners that have been talked about a lot in literature. Um, and the way they're being influenced is on the basis of some perceptual linkage that is not just occurring on a segment-to-segment -segment basis. Now, when I looked at the amount of VOT lengthening that was occurring in the novice learners, I was surprised at the fact that it was approaching 20 milliseconds, which is actually a large increase in VOT. And uh, when you compare that to the results that have been found for um, advanced learners, it's a lot bigger, and I was confused as to why this might be. But then I thought about the fact that actually the, the, the fact that they don't know Korean could help this happen because it's so new to them. This new, this new language is so, uh, I guess you can think about it as exciting perceptually. They've never heard this before. And so, so could that give some uh, cognitive boost basically to the encoding of this information? Maybe that's why they're actually showing this pronounced effect. In order to see whether that was the case, I compared those novice learners to people in the exact same program. And these are people who have learned Korean before. So they have some experience with the language, either through heritage exposure or formal study. And the question was, will they show less of an effect on their English by virtue of the fact that this is not so new to them? They, they've heard this before. Um, and that is what happens. So um, if you look at the VOT for voiceless stops, um, they do get influenced by the fact that now they're in this immersion environment, they're studying Korean intensively, but the effect on their English VOT is not as great. So you get this significant interaction between time and group where that's coming about basically because the increase in VOT is not as great for the experienced group. Um, and it's the same thing for F0. So they are getting influenced uh, uh, in terms of F0 raising, but it's not as great as it is for the uh, novice learners. Okay, <clears throat> so basically the conclusion of that subset of studies is that um, as you increase the amount of experience, so your proficiency also in the L2, actually what's going on is that the potential influence on your L1 goes down. And um, this has started to be followed up uh, on by people from Judy Kroll's lab. And an alternative explanation for this is that um, there's also some inhibition that's going on where um, when you're just starting to learn a second language, it's harder to do it because you're native language is relatively more strong compared to this new language. So you have to do more work in terms of inhibiting the first language. And that aids the influence of the second language on the first language. So that's one 
converging, I don't know that that's actually inconsistent with what I've proposed, but um, that's another way to think about these results that um, because of that, you know, as you get uh, more proficient in L2, the L2, the L1 is now not as relatively strong as it was before, so there is not as much of a need to inhibit that system. Okay, so these are novice learners, and so far I've talked all about L1, <coughs> and really, um, <coughs> there's uh, two levels, uh, two directions of influence that we should be considering. So um, last set of studies that I'm going to be talking about has to do with influence of L1 on L2. And I love this set of studies because people always like hearing the sound files. <laughs> so um, I'll get to those uh, very quickly, which uh, is right here. So um, this is a study that had to do with perception, speech perception. So, so far I've, all, I've talked about pronunciation. But here we're talking about final stops in English, final voiceless stops. And they vary in terms of whether there is a full pronunciation, a release, or an, an unreleased pronunciation. And these are spectrograms of, of the same speaker uttering the words pup and putt, either released. Pup. Putt where you see that um, there's a lot of information in the burst, which you, is uh, here in the spectrogram. Um, there's a difference in uh, loudness. There's a difference in the frequency distribution. There's a difference also in the duration. Um, when you don't have that information and the stop is unreleased, huh. Huh. you can still hear the difference. And the way you hear the difference, or the thing you're queuing into, is this difference in the transition uh, in the final part of the vowel. So here the F2 frequency is showing a different uh, trajectory. Here it's relatively flat in pup, and in putt it goes up quite steeply. So this is how, without the benefit of the information in the burst, one can tell that someone is saying putt t, as opposed to pup. So the question here is uh, how native language experience will affect the way people do this in English. And before I get to those uh, results, uh, it's important to point out that um, American English, which is the target language here, um, shows this disparity between frequency or how often something occurs in the language and the status of a variant in the language, so um, what I'll refer to as canonicity. But um, for voice, final voice of stops, um, they are very frequently not released at all places of articulation. But despite that, the released versions are still recognized as canonical and have more influence in priming tasks, for example. And so this is really the variant that we could reasonably posit is somewhere in the underlying representation, uh, where unreleased T is very clearly the more frequent variant in conversational American English, but still, American English speakers, you put them in a priming experiment and you ask them to identify dog as a real word, they're going to do that quicker if they hear cat as opposed to cat, even though cat is the more frequent pronunciation. So there's this disconnect between disparity and canonicity for release in American English. Uh, this is different for other languages where um, frequency and canonicity coincide, because in fact the unreleased variant is the only way you can pronounce these sounds. So this is the case in Korean where final stops, final voice of stops must be pronounced as unreleased. And in fact, if you release it, it sounds like you're saying like a, an additional syllable. So um, this is also important because um, final stop place contrast has a heavy functional load. So there are many minimal triplets like pat, pat, pak that only contrast in the place of articulation of the final stop. So that leads to the question of if you are a Korean speaker and you're learning English, Will that help you in telling apart these final stops in English? Because you were trained so much in Korean at using that information in the final vowel to tell apart these final uh, place contrasts. So there's three groups in this study. And so the question is whether these same unreleased stops in American English will be better perceived by the people who should be the gold standard, the native listeners, or people who are not native in some way, but have some experience from another language. And the groups here are the native English group who have no experience with Korean or any other language that has unreleased final stops, like Cantonese or Thai, for example. Um, they stack up with the other groups um, in the following way. So for all three of these groups, both the native English, the native Korean, late learners of English, so these are mostly people who came to the States in like their 20s for grad school or something like this, and then um, the heritage Korean group, which is a group of Korean Americans who 
either were born in the States or came to the States very early and essentially uh, are native English speakers. They've been educated all in English and they have this early experience with hearing Korean too. So for all of these groups, um, the unruly stops are at least frequent in their input. For uh, two of these groups, the Kore native Korean group and the heritage Korean group, the unruly version is also the ideal version for some language the canonical version, and uh, two of these groups, the native Korean group and the heritage Korean group, has early exposure to Korean, um, but only the native English group and the heritage Korean group has early experience with English. So the native Korean group came late to the States. So that's how these groups stack up against each other. And if we were to take this information into consideration, then um, if we believe that uh, being ideal in your language might give you some sort of perceptual advantage on perceiving that structure, then the prediction is that um, native English listeners are actually not going to be the best at doing this. Even though English is their native language, um, the Korean speakers will be better because they've received more training essentially in how to do this. And I looked at this in two conditions, um, one with non-words, so without the benefit of lexical information, and then one with uh, lexical information. Okay, so the first experiment um, has to do with um, uh, identification and the stimuli are being uh, spoken by these two Maryland English speakers um, and the groups are as I've shown you here and um, they're pretty similar in age they're all in their 20s but again the Korean group they're generally grad students so they're a little bit older um, and one thing I want to point out is that this heritage Korean group they are native English speakers they're, they've grown up in the States um, but they have this additional experience with Korean. Other thing to point out is that they are not native Korean speakers Technically, Korean is their first language, but their Korean is not native-like. Both in terms of how, I mean, I also tried speaking with them in Korean afterwards, um, after the experiment, and also had them rate themselves, for example, and their Korean is not native-like. No one rates themselves as native-like on these measures. Um, okay. <clears throat> so this is what they're listening to. Um, nonce words that are bisyllabic, and they're constructed to be specifically English-like. So for that purpose, the first CVC is ruz. So r is very Englishy. It also doesn't occur in Korean. Z is another segment that doesn't occur in Korean. Uh, and then the second vowel and the consonant vary in the following way, where the second vowel um, uh, contains either a, a monophthong, e u a, or a dynamic vowel nucleus, a o i r, uh, where those nuclei do not occur in Korean, and also objectively should be harder because they inherently have formant movement. So the task of trying to tell what the formant movement is for the vowel versus what's coming from the consonant is going to be harder for these dynamic nuclei. And then the consonant varies between either a P, T, K, or unreleased, or nothing. So we could have, and there's a variation in stress, so we could have um, items like razite versus razite versus razai versus razai. Um, so these are the types of things they're listening to, and to make it even harder for the Korean speakers, I embedded these um, in a sentence and had them basically identify the last sound of the final word in the sentence. So they're hearing something like this. Now the word is bizarre. So I'll play it one more time so you can try to guess what the correct answer is. <laughs> oh. Now the word is bizarre. T? So the correct answer is K. <laughs> now the word is resark. Um, so this is a speeded task. They're being asked to do this as quickly as possible to say P, T, sounds like P, sounds like T, sounds like K, or sounds like something else. Um, and the analysis is similar to what I've done before in the previous studies. And in this identification task, this is what you get. So the native Koreans are in black. The heritage Koreans, the intermediate group, is in gray, and then the uh, native English group is in white. Um, on the stops, the final stops on the left, the native Korean group is better than the native English group, although that difference is only marginally significant. The heritage Korean group is significantly better than the native English group. The, for the um, Razai type stimuli, everyone is good. People are performing at uh, ceiling. It's not that hard to say that Razai doesn't end in a PT or K. So that's expected. Um, 
importantly, if you look at the same data, but just look at the uh, judgments on the stimuli that had AOIR, it's the same. So that advantage um, uh, of having Korean experience extends to when you're looking at vowel environments that do not occur in Korean. So this is some sort of general knowledge about how to extract information from the final part of a vowel. Because they never would have gotten that experience from having this form and transition for A in Korean. That's not something they could just be pretending like they're hearing uh, in Korean. Um, if you look at the reaction times, uh, what's important about that is that this effect cannot be a, a speed accuracy trade-off type of thing because in fact these groups, in particular the Heritage Korean group, tends to be responding faster. So it's not the case that they're doing better just because they're taking longer and thinking about it more to enter their response. Okay, so at least without lexical information, there seems to be this benefit of knowing Korean. So maybe that was a little unfair because, um, you know, people use lexical information to do speech perception. So let's give back the lexical information to the native English listeners and maybe they'll do a lot better then because now they have native lexical knowledge that they can use to narrow down the set of candidate parses of some ambiguous signal. So this is an AX discrimination task and um, the stimuli here are uh, these monosyllabic English words that were balanced for spoken frequency using the corpus of contemporary American English. Um, so uh, these are stop pairs that differ in the place of the final stop, so like lip versus lick, um, and also pairs that differ in whether there is a stop, like uh, peak versus p. And so the task is, as quickly as you can, say whether the two different people are saying the same word or different words. So the experiment goes something like this. Wait. Lay. So same or different? Wait. Lay. Yeah different. Lake versus lay. And uh, here is another pair. Cat. Cat. Uh, different? Cat. Cat. They are different. Cat versus cap. Yeah. Um, so what you're going to see as the dependent variable on the graph is uh, D prime, which is a model of how sensitive people are to some sort of change in the signal. Um, and what you see is consistent with what you saw in the identification experiment. So there is this tendency for, well, the difference between the native Korean group and the native English group is not significant, but the heritage Korean group shows a non-significant tendency to outperform the native English group. Um, on the stop zero pairs, the native Korean group is better than the native English group, and the heritage Korean group is better still. So they are the best of all, and they're also better than the native Korean group. Um, if you look at the reaction times, it's the same situation. The heritage Korean group is actually faster. They tend to be faster than everyone. Um, so this is not a speed effect. Okay, so basically what we have here is seemingly at least um, some beneficial effect of having some different language experience that is not the target language. So both the groups of Korean speakers, the native ones and the heritage ones, seem to be better than the native English ones at perceiving English, at this stop, uh, perceiving the stop contrast to English. And this is not due to priming, for example, because I didn't address the heritage Korean speakers in Korean. I s spoke to them all in English up until after the experiment. Um, so this is interesting because if you look at some other findings in the literature, in particular those of Sun Young Lee, uh, Lee Ellis, who worked on heritage speakers too of Korean, um, it seems like there's this kind of best case scenario in terms of early perceptual experience where um, in her case, she was finding that the heritage Korean speakers that she was looking at, they were pa patterning like L1 English speakers, native English speakers, are perceiving some sort of English specific contrast in syllable structure. Um, and in this case, what I'm seeing is that if the Korean experience has a, ben a potential benefit, then you do get transfer from Korean. So she found no transfer from Korean because that transfer would have been negative, would have been detrimental. And what I'm finding is that if the transfer happens to have a potential benefit, then you do get the transfer. Um, so that taken together, this suggests a kind of best case scenario uh, in terms of transfer from the native language. Um, also, I mean, bilingualism is in the news a lot lately because of these cognitive benefits that have been um, identified in terms of uh, delaying Alzheimer's and so on. Um, and what I would add is basically that 
knowing another language is beneficial because it gives you more resources to tackle some sort of task. So these native Korean, uh, both the native Korean and the heritage Korean listeners, they've learned that there's a lot of information in the final part of the vowel. Maybe we can use that to our advantage. And they've learned that in a way that the people who have, learned, who have heard English their entire lives haven't gotten from that experience. OK, so um, just returning to those three points that we had at the beginning, um, it doesn't seem like uh, the way people are equating structures across languages is segmental specifically going on at the lexical phonetic level, as well as the segmental level, things below the level of the segment or natural class level, um, and uh, linkages also at the level of a system, like we saw for vowels. Um, the way L1 transfer is going to affect what you do in the L2 is not going to be necessarily negative, but actually it'll depend specifically on the properties we, we we're talking about and how they match up with each other. And um, with respect to uh, this flowback from L2 to L1, this seems actually to be the reverse of what has been assumed in the literature. In fact, when you gain war experience, it decreases the amount of influence that you're going to get cross-linguistically. OK, um, so this approach, the reason why I've um, taken it is because I think that um, looking at the way two languages are interacting within a mind gives us something uh, in terms of insight that you can't get without looking at a cross-linguistic situation. So in particular, um, uh, for instance, uh, looking at historical sound change. If you want to analyze uh, patterns of uh, lexical diffusion, for example, there are certain patterns of sound change that might be explained in, in the exact way that I've talked about with Shanghainese, where there's some specific cross-linguistic similarity that is motivating the change, and that's where it starts, and, and that leads to a specific uh, pattern of diffusion across the lexicon. Um, that's something that you can't really explain in terms of um, or if, if it's a contact-induced change, you need to look at both languages and how they line up with each other in order to uh, make some sort of prediction. Um, the other thing that I would point out is that, for example, for vowels and change in vowels, um, you need to look at a cross-linguistic situation in order to understand that, at some level, speakers are representing knowledge about overall height or overall feature of the vowel system which you can't get unless the language happens to have some sort of phenomenon that is making reference to height over all vowels of the system. Whereas here, we've seen that effect come out by virtue of this influence or change uh, in the overall height of the system um, across languages. So some, something that is a systemic feature might really be better investigated by looking at cross-linguistic um, uh, phenomena. <coughs> OK, and just practically, um, people who are doing research I think uh, need to really carefully define who they're looking at. Because um, when you look at uh, linguists who are working monolingually, often actually you find that the population they purport to investigate is not actually the population that they recruited. <laughs> so um, for example, um, if you look at studies of Swedish, for example, they're not specifically about Swedish bilinguals, yet a lot of these studies look at Swedish bilinguals, and it's not reasonable to conclude that that study is going to generalize to monolingual S Swedish speakers living in Sweden, because they're not monolingual Swedish speakers living in Sweden. They're a different population. Um, and you know, um, I've only talked about phonetics, but really this is the case at any level of language. Many other studies have shown that in aspects of morphosyntax, aspects of uh, <laughs> cognitive representation, and also gesture, that people are influenced by this other language knowledge that they have. <clears throat> uh, and just in terms of just language study, I mean, if you are, if your goal is to get native-like input, that's not likely to happen if you're not living in the native speech community, uh, by virtue of the fact that your teacher, unless they're just really sheltering themselves from the dominant language of the community, is also likely to be influenced by the dominant language of the community. Um, so, I mean, basically, the the implication is that. If you are um, learning from an imported language instructor, it's not that they're not going to teach you well, but that input is going to be different than the input you would get in the native uh, language environment. OK, um, just a quick few words about um, where to go from here. Um, one thing that I'm very interested in is the degree to which uh, having acquired this second language experience that seems to have, at some level, restructured a representation of your native language, how long does that restructuring last? Because there's virtually nothing in the literature that has looked at 
um, effects or influence of distal or distant second language experience um, that was acquired a long time ago. So you learn some language and you go back to your native country, basically don't speak that language for a while. Do you go back to returning like, do you return to monolingual like pronunciation for example is not a question that has been addressed really. Um, to the degree that I've looked at it with this set of learners, the pattern seems to be, um, no, you don't go back to baseline. <laughs> you stay a little bit different. Um, but this is something that I think needs to be looked at systematically. Um, and then with respect to the heritage advantage, the one thing I want to point out is that it is not always the case that heritage speakers are native-like um, in the heritage language or the dominant language. And so what, is, what are the set of factors that determine whether they extract the maximum benefit from the heritage language I think is a major research program and, and I think um, is really promising in terms of um, questions for these sorts of cross-linguistic issues. That's it. Thanks. Uh, well, the one, one thing I want to mention is that there are many, many studies here and they benefited from the input of lots of people and also funding from lots of institutions and discussion with lots of um, labs around the states and also the world. So thanks to them and to you. Thank you very much, Charles, for um, yeah, some, very, um, some very interesting findings. I'm sure we have some questions you have at the time for... Okay. Any questions? Uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, you showed that the, the effect on L1 of uh, experience by experienced speakers is less than by normal speakers. Is it maybe because they already like raised their voice? Uh, no. So um, if you look at so that's a good question. If you look at this plot, uh, is this right? Yes. So actually the difference in week one between the novice and the experienced learners is not significantly different. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also the case for F0. So it's not the case that it's, they're not going up as much because they've already gone up a lot. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess a follow up to that, <laughs> while other people formulate questions, <laughs> is that um, you would think but that would suggest that the question I referred to at the end with respect to if after you've been removed from the second language experience, do you go back to sounding monolingual? That, that would suggest the answer to that question is yes. Because these people who learned Korean at some point in time in the past, after one week of instruction, they're, they're not yet different from the people who have never learned Korean before. So it seems like they, you know, if we kind of think about what might have happened in the past that, yeah, after they learned Korean in their first year undergraduate course or whatever, they went back to being English-like after they stopped using Korean. What I think actually is going on is that um, uh, that does happen, but really what the important variable is is um, uh, alternations in experience. So they, they have gotten the benefit of essentially a, uh, a break from Korean. So they've learned Korean at some point in time and then they've lived in the States and have been operating mostly in English and that has essentially allowed the first language uh, English system to sort of recover um, and go back to whatever it used to be. Um, and then now when they're encountering second language experience um, it's not as um, uh, influential. Um, yeah. But I mean, I think the degree to which it actually does go back to baseline is still an open question because really we're just guessing as to what happened in the past and we don't really know. Yeah. Uh, yeah you alluded to this earlier on. Can you um, say what you think about the difference between the male and the female? Oh, yeah. So um, the male learners um, in this program, they do not increase their F0. And the most likely explanation for this that I think. Um, is, a, is behind this is uh, the fact that there is this cross gender situation with them, so they don't have they don't have the right gender model um, in terms of their target language, and so um, in, in that respect, I think that they don't have the same motivation to accommodate to this higher F zero because maybe this higher F zero is higher because it's coming from a different gender. The women are all women. So when they have this model of a female Korean teacher talking to them, 
they don't have the same uh, excuse for not accommodating to that F0 because it's the same gender. So the fact that this Korean speaker is uh, using a higher F0 means that there's something significant about the higher F0. If you're a male learner and you're uh, uh, receiving instruction from a female Korean teacher, you don't really know, or it's harder to know, whether the higher F0 in Korean that they're hearing is due to the fact that Korean has higher F0 or to the fact that because she's a woman, she has higher F0. I think that might be interfering with their uh, processing, basically, the way they're interpreting this information of higher F0. The other thing is that um, just generally in the sociolinguistic literature, it's been pointed out that males modulate F0 in a way that is different from females. So it may be the case that males just on balance are more averse to increasing F0 range or increasing F0 in general. So yeah, that, that's a possible, possible other explanation. Yes. <clears throat> I was wondering about um, well, one of the issues that where, um, when you think about the cognitive system, how it's structured is, you know, neighborhood density on the different levels that take place. And we know from uh, primary literature that when you get to a certain level, you know, semantics um, slows you down while phonetics or phonology speeds you up, right? So one of the questions I was wondering about is when you get a, to a certain kind of level of proficiency, um, how this then would transfer over, right? Because one mm. of the things that, for example, Maria Gilbert's work shows is, you know, the question is, at which point in time when you have acquired a particular language does a semantic reorganization of how at the conceptual level comes down to, right? Mm -hmm. what you can see in the semantic representation of the just word. And so this then feeds down into the semantic representation and then again feeds down into reorganization of the phonological level. Right, right. Um, I think that's a very interesting point, point. Um, and you know, I actually, I don't, I don't know of a good way yet to test, or I guess operationalize um, how well developed people's semantic representations of Korean are yet. But I wouldn't be surprised if it were the case that part of the reason why they seem that when the experienced learners are going through the same language program that they are being less influenced is that at least some of the words in their second language lexicon are have the have more opportunity to be separate because they have a more robust semantic representation or more robust I mean I think that's very likely to be the case yeah mm -hmm. I mean, you have an interaction with neighbor identity on a morphological but also on a phonological level that is also interacting so that's another difficult thing to oh right right, parts, right? Mm -hmm. that's not only the semantic part I mean this, this relates to study, right, where, where one of the issues, of course, you know, frequency is one thing, but frequency is kind of more, um, there's more complex interactions with right. the density that. Yeah, and, and one thing I want to mention um, that also complicates this is that we have not considered tone at all, which is actually one component yeah. or proposed to be one component of neighborhood density in Chinese yeah. that languages because it's a feature of a word. And uh, the reason why we haven't considered it is because it is just too difficult. Um, Shanghainese has so many tone sandy patterns and to try to get equivalence between the Mandarin and the Shanghainese forms at a f at least a phonetic tone level is just, it's, you don't have any items left after you eliminate <laughs> uh, for, all, for all of those differences. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an excellent point. Yeah, it, the effect of neighborhood density is surely going to have some sort of influence on people's production, which we have not, we've abstracted away from that here, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, what's your next project going to be? Like, what are you, how are you following up from, from Oh, that? so my next the paper I'm writing now <laughs> has to do with um, the data that I collected from these novice learners, actually also the experienced ones, um, after they had been in Korea for a year, um, but had stopped speaking Korean. So uh, the question is whether the people who studied Korean for those six weeks and then you know went to their placement and teach, taught English, uh, but were in an English environment um, but, uh, in terms of uh, requiring them to speak Korean, 
they had a home stay that spoke English, so they didn't have to speak Korean. They went to school, and all the co-teachers spoke English, so they didn't have to speak Korean. Um, these people who basically stopped speaking Korean after this language program, but they're still in the foreign language environment, they're still hearing Korean around them, do they go back to baseline? Um, and the answer is no. They don't go back to baseline. They do go back down in that direction, but about 50, yeah, 52 weeks after this initial set of measurements, when they do the same task, they are still uh, significantly different. And I think it's very interesting because, I mean, they are not actively studying the language anymore. I mean, one way that you could interpret these results um, is that there's some special thing that happens during learning. You're attending to the linguistic input more uh, uh, conscientiously, or you're, you're just devoting more cognitive resources to that. And maybe that's part of the reason why they're so influenced by it. They, they're just so actively engaged with the L2 at this point. Well, OK, if we remove that element, um, does that you know, eliminate this L2 influence? And I, I think the uh, explanation for the fact that they stay um, shifted is kind of the phenomenon where if you're like sitting in a cafe and you're trying to uh, ignore the people sitting next to you, it's much harder to do that when they speak a language that you know. And so there is this difference in processing of ambient language once you know that language. So even though they are not really speaking Korean with people, they still hear Korean and, and they know it enough now that they can't block out that exposure in the way that they used to. And I think that is part of what is helping promote this shifted English because um, essentially Korean is staying active. They, they, they can't turn it off anymore. They, they know too much. <laughs> they know too much. Yeah. Do you have a control group for that? Like people who are exposed to Korean but don't know, like I don't know, the ambassador's wives, you know, <laughs> just listen to it, uh, listen to their maze talk in Korean all the time. But they don't oh, know but it. they don't, they never even studied it. Um, actually, would, would that actually shift that? yeah, that, that would be very, I haven't collected data from that group. Yeah, so I only have data from this group that has some like critical mass mm. of Korean knowledge that might help make it hard for them to tune out this ambient exposure. What is the proficiency level at that point? Not very good. So Korean is what's categorized as a category four language, which is the most difficult for native English speakers to learn. And they only learned it for six weeks. If you want to become like high intermediate, uh, high elementary level, actually one plus on the interagency language roundtable scale, you need to study Korean for 64 weeks, which is over twice as long as it would take to get that same level of proficiency in a romance language like Spanish or French. So basically, at least in terms of time, Korean is more than twice as hard as these romance languages. So they didn't study it for very long. So reasonably, it can be assumed that they weren't very good. And you know, just from personal experience, just seeing them struggle <laughs> when they're ordering and, and, and this sort of thing in the community, yeah, their, their, their command of the language is rudimentary. So it's, it's not really the case that you know, they are being influenced because they're just so good. It's definitely not. Not, we can uh, retire to the IOE. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's thank Charles again. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.